want to say from the Walmart piece and the Walmart family and um, you know, from the Louisa store itself of, of Lawrence County, uh, we always try to try to be in many different organizations and, and be a part of a huge part of our community and I'm uh, really happy to uh, uh, from Walmart stance for me to be a part of the, the uh, Southeast uh, Kentucky Chamber of Commerce here in Louisa and look forward to helping grow the community and uh, as many of you know that know me and, and throughout that I support about anything and we support every business that wants to come in this community and uh, anything we can do to help uh, make that work uh, we will uh, again thank you. We put a priority on the safety and health of our employees. That's core value number one. So we believe that we ought to send our employees home the same way that they came to work. Our second core value is environmental and regulatory compliance. And what I mean by that is, is we comply with all environmental rules and regulations. We don't violate them. Not only do we not violate them, we believe we know what the right thing to do is as far as the environment's concerned and therefore we consider ourselves a steward of the environment. So I say all that to tell you that we're not anti-EPA and we're not anti-environmental. Quite honestly, I'm going to show you here on the next slide where we've done everything possible over the past 20 years to reduce the amount of emissions that come out of our smokestacks. Use at hand, I want to go into a little bit more detail at this point about the EPA regulations. <coughs> This is just a simple timeline that shows the EPA what guideline they're proposing and on what time frame, and it gives a little bit of detail about what the regulation will accomplish. The first one is called the Clean Air Transport Rule. At the time this presentation was made, it was called that. It's since been changed. I think it's called the Cross State transport rule <coughs> and for those of you who don't know when you burn a fuel whether it's gas or whether it's coal it produces some byproducts in the flue gas we refer to them as SO2 or NOx sulfur dioxide or nitro nitrogen oxide so this first rule seeks to actually reduce those numbers by state and it sets limits on them. that proposal goes into effect January of 2014. The way in which you mitigate that is you install a scrubber. A scrubber commonly referred to, or it's called an FGD, flue gas desulfurization, reduces the amount of SO2 in the flue gas as a result of burning coal or any other sort of fossil fuel. These, at least we make an investment in a pollution control technology or a fuel switch. The second rule, the regional haze rule, does not apply to us. The third rule called HAPS or hazardous air pollutants deals with what they call acid gases. It's basically more constituents that are in our flue gas as a result of burning fossil fuel. It seeks to control hydrogen chlorides, mercury, and particulate matter. The way in which you mitigate is you install something called a bag house, which is commonly associated with installing a scrubber. Once again, another option would be to switch the fuel to say natural gas. To comply with this rule and this rule, you can actually switch fuels to gas instead of making an investment in the pollution control technology. <coughs> the fourth rule called CCR, coal combustion residual, basically deals with, if, it, if any of you are aware of the incident that happened in Kingston, Tennessee, where the fly ash pond dam broke and it flooded the river. Most of you saw the pictures on the TV. This, this regulation seeks to, uh, to remedy that up at the big sandy plant and many facilities across AEP, we have these ash ponds. The way in which you mitigate that is again, you just drain it. It's fairly simple. You drain it, you either line it, or you convert to what they call a dry fly ash system. And again, that, that compliance deadline is January of 2018. 
I'm not going to go into uh, the water issue at this point. I'm just going to focus in on these first three, the transport rule, the HAPS rule, and the cold combustion residual. And I want to focus in on the timeline between now and January of 2018. Because in the beginning, I told you guys we're not anti-EPA, we're not anti-environmental. <coughs> what we're asking and what we're respectfully challenging is the EPA's timeline. We simply need more time. We're not arguing with continuing to clean up and continuing to improve the amount of emissions that are coming out of our staff. We simply want more time. I talked about one of the ways in which to comply with the HAPS rule, one of the ways in which to comply with the transport rule is to install a scrubber. And what I'd like to point out to you is right down here, this is where we're at right now, in the middle of 2011, AEP has installed seven scrubber systems over the past five to ten years in AEP, and we know from experience that from cradle to grave, it takes approximately five years to make that happen. Depicting the middle of 2016 right here. If you go back and think back to the graph that I just showed you, even if we as a company right now at Big Sandy or any other power plant in AEP decided to install a scrubber, we could not meet the compliance deadline. It's physically impossible. Power our unit one to gas. Right now it stands as about a 640 megawatt unit. You see the gap, we're going to shut both of these down at the end of 214, and we're not going to start this one up to the end of 215, so there's going to be a one year gap. Here's the sticker shock rates will go up 30 to 35 percent in this area. There's the loss of taxes, property, payroll, and, and lost wages. You might ask, why wouldn't, because I've talked about a couple of different strategies, why not scrub, why are you converting to natural gas? And the answer is very simple. If these regulations are targeted at coal, and then therefore there's a lot of uncertainty about a company like AEP continuing to use coal as its primary source, especially when the initial investment has not been made. If you remember a little bit ago, I talked about the John Amos plant, the Gavin plant. They've already had the initial scrubber. They've already had the initial SCR. So it's an upgrade. The initial investment is already made. We can't do anything about the regulations. At Big Sandy, we haven't made that initial investment in the scrubber, and therefore it's decision time and therefore the uncertainty is driving right now our decision to repower with natural gas and move away from coal. Some of you may know that you're reasonable time. One of the things that I haven't touched on that is the amount of construction that is being proposed, if we were to go through with all this, is so enormous that we don't believe that we can physically get it done. It isn't just about repowering Big Sandy 1 with a, a combined cycle gas plant. It is about a regional construction pool that we don't believe, we don't believe they can handle the workload. That will then in turn translate into inefficiencies it will translate into longer construction time frames, which end up costing the rate pair more. The point here is, we're going to get to the same goal. How fast you do it is the issue. The purpose is the coal burning at AP will most likely end. Not end, but it, we, uh, we will significantly diversify. pressure is being placed on coal by the regulations. Absolutely.
very short, but we have gone over time. Aaron did say he would stick around for some questions. If you'd like to stick around, you have a pressing question. Uh, Aaron, we do appreciate you coming by and, and, and sharing some of this information with you. Made it through uh, this pressure work and all of us. We appreciate you coming. Thank you all. Again, a round of applause for Aaron.